morning is found from Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all he lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. From Philippians 4, verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praise shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In our hearing of the word, we can acknowledge our Bible is a word of encouragement, a voice of hope, a message of joy, and a journey that results in praise for all of us who choose to participate. Today we fine-tune our focus to the topic of thanksgiving. Our awareness of this word and its meaning more than likely began before our earliest recollections. From the earliest moment when a child begins to understand and communicate their desires, a parent teaches a child to say, thank you. It's not really something that comes natural to the child because it seems to be a lesson that needs to be repeated time and again. When a child is handed a cookie by his or her parent, the dialogue is usually something along the lines that say, I want a cookie. Okay, here's the cookie. Now what do you say? Later in life, the wants seem to focus around materialism, toys, particular types of clothing, hairstyles, cars, the list goes on. We know the saying, the bigger the boys, the bigger the toys. Yet I think on a different level and perhaps at a different stage of life, we simply want to be thanked or appreciated, not so much for objects, but rather for who we are and for what we might mean to others, for what we have or have not done, either directly or indirectly. Many, many years ago, I was asked to be a soloist at a wedding for my wife's niece who was getting married in North Carolina. I originally declined the proposition for several reasons. One, at that point in time in my life, I had not sung professionally for 12 years. Neither the bride nor the groom had any idea what kind of music they wanted for their wedding. I had no ideas of the skills or the lack thereof of the accompanist that I would have to work with at the very last minute. My car, which was less than a year old, had its third transmission in it and it was still acting up. I really didn't want to borrow a car to drive to North Carolina. Finally, I didn't know the bride, I didn't know the groom, so why should I go to all the trouble of selecting scores, preparing pieces, driving 1,500 miles round trip for people I don't even know? My mother-in-law was an individual who managed to maintain that sweet little old lady persona. And when she heard that I was declining, she phoned and said, 
Now would you do your sweet little mother-in-law a favor? How do you say no to the sweet little old mother of your wife and survive? <laughs> so I attempted to extract from the bride on the phone what type of music she would like for her wedding. Did you want religious? Did you want contemporary? What is it you desire? She didn't have any idea whatsoever but she did know that whatever was to be done had to be on the approved list of the church and of the organist. I asked her to get me a copy of the list. And after a few days of phone calls to Carolina, and this is back in the days when you paid for those phone calls to other states, she said, I really don't know how to get a hold of the copy of the list, but you can buy whatever you want and you mail it to the church, and they'll tell you if it's good enough. I muttered all the way to the music store to make my selections. And for the next few weeks, I tried to discipline my voice into remembering what it was like to sing professionally again. Scales, arpeggios, vowel warm-ups that had almost been totally erased from my mind slowly began to reappear. And eventually time passed, the selections fell into what I thought was a passable range, and we headed to Carolina in a borrowed car. The night of the wedding rehearsal, I arrived at the church 40 minutes early to work with the accompanist, who I knew nothing of, only to find that their pipe organ was a half step out of pitch within one octave because someone forgot to turn the dehumidifier on underneath the pipe organ. And they also forgot to turn the air conditioning on in the church. In Carolina, when it's 100 degrees, it's also about 99% humidity. The organist and I debated for about 10 minutes over where to set the stops for the three selections and then worked mostly on the piano for the rehearsal. Throughout this entire time, neither the bride or the groom never said one single solitary word to me. I attempted to make conversation with them several times. Total silence. At the rehearsal dinner, the bride and the groom passed out gifts to all their ushers and matrons, but again, neither one of them even thought of giving a word of thanks or a gesture in my direction. The same was true for the night of the wedding and the reception. Not one single syllable or tangible sign of appreciation. Now in my mind, I began making excuses for them. They're young. They're preoccupied. Perhaps their parents forced me into a wedding they didn't want me to attend at all. And later that night, after the wedding and reception and departure of the newlyweds, my brother-in-law brother came up and he says, you had to buy that sheet music for yourself and the organist, didn't you? I suppose I'm obligated to pay you for it, aren't I? All I really wanted was acknowledgement for the time and effort from those that it should have meant something to the most. And after returning home, that pestering little thought of ingratitude kept creeping into my mind. And while I was having a time of Bible study and devotion in the midst of the prayer, I said, Lord, would it have killed them to say thank you? Or even to say anything at all? Didn't they know the preparation, the effort, the time, the travel, the losing of my vacation time, or the financial expense it was for me to haul my family down there? Not to mention I had to borrow someone else's car to get there because my transmission was on the blink. Don't these people think? Don't they have any sensitivity? And that answer from God came immediately to me but not necessarily what I wanted. The response that entered my mind was simply, so tell me something new. 
Tell me all the times I am thanked. Tell me all the times I am acknowledged. Tell me something that hasn't been true since the beginning of creation. It is true, you know. While 73 times from the book of 2 Samuel to the 11th chapter of Revelation, the word thanks is used in the Bible, it's rarely in the form of a personal thanks. Thanks. Nowhere in our Bible can we find the simple phrase, thank you, Lord, or thank you, God. Remember the numbers of healings Jesus did and how many people never came back to say thanks. And perhaps this is not only indicative of individuals in those days, but also those in our times as well. A well-known televangelist back in the 70s once asked a very simple outreach question. When other people examine you as a Christian, are we by nature a thankful people? When others look at us, do they see someone living on Glory Boulevard or Grumble Alley? And let's take a moment and think about ourselves, our witness, and our own personal point of view. The discernment can be as simple as the standard question, do I see a glass as half empty or as half full? How do people react to me as an individual? Now there are many times I want to be affirmative and optimistic individual who conveys that optimism to those that are about me. But in reality, unfortunately, there are times I succumb to the weight of the challenges about me and I unknowingly change my address from a boulevard of glory to an alley full of grumbles. In this season, we celebrate the American ideal of thanksgiving. Sometimes we take the ecclesiastical approach to this event by saying, well, there is a time and a purpose for every activity under heaven, and Congress has declared this Thursday of November as being Thanksgiving. So be it. While Labor Day, New Year's Day, the 4th of July, to name a few, are declared a legal holiday, they are acknowledged at a specific point in time. The same cannot be said for the word thanksgiving. True thanksgiving is not a season, a place, a climate, or a legal mandate. Thanksgiving is a state of mind that can be as perpetual or as absent as we intentionally choose. The psalmist says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, Enter his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his holy name. Over the centuries, you know, churches have changed quite a bit. In England, prior to the Industrial Revolution, it was quite common for the parsonage to be built on the opposite end of town from the church. Does anybody know why? Each Sunday morning, the pastor would leave his home and he would gather the congregation on the way to the service. And as they are walking toward the church, they would catch up on community news, do what we today might call a bit of networking, and they did a lot of singing. So by the time they got to the church, they would literally be entering the building singing and full of joy. They were prepared already for worship to receive a blessing and to be a blessing. If we were to place a barometer against our church and lift out but three words from this psalm to use as indicators of our worship, we might well consider the words that encourage us to enter with a joyful noise to serve the Lord with gladness. 
It is when we find joy in individuals committed to servanthood that carries with them that air of gladness that we begin to discover true thankfulness in the world about us. We are reminded to come before his presence with singing, to enter his courts with praise. Like the example given in the beginning of this message, a life which reflects thankfulness is not always one which we easily or naturally come by. Nor do all of us learn this ability easily. It is one which we must at times deliberately practice. It is, if you will, an acquired lifestyle that pays rich blessings and dividends to those who surrender to its persuasive power. The Apostle Paul shares something else with us this morning in his letter to the church at Philippi. He says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In this passage, we find two words of encouragement. First and foremost, Paul acknowledges that the faith community need not be totally satisfied with whatever befalls them, but rather we can take everything and anything to God in prayer. He modifies this thought with a clarifying statement which says that thanksgiving is a natural accompaniment in the element of prayer. We have heard or perhaps even ourselves offered prayers without this vital ingredient, which perhaps then seems to fall on deaf ears. Just as the word says the Lord loves a cheerful giver, it also encourages us to come to prayer with an air of thanksgiving. How often do we come to God with a joyful heart, a heart of thanksgiving, a heart of praise? How often are we thankful for those about us? For some of us, this appears all fine and good, technically, but what about the practical in the everyday living? Thankfulness is a learned behavior. And since we are indeed most times creatures of habit, we need to practice in order to become that which we preach and proclaim. So in this moment, let's take a few seconds. Reflect on our past. Let us consider someone that we have truly been thankful for and how we have shared that gratitude with them. Perhaps it's a relative, a neighbor, a co-worker, a teacher, or a host of other individuals that have been a part of our life journey. How have we conveyed that thankful appreciation? It's been understood that while many church-going people enjoy their time in a worship service, many of us have a problem with specific recollections after the first three hours have passed and the sermon fades from our memory. So today before this entire afternoon passes into sunset, Make the deliberate and conscious choice to be that individual of thanksgiving. Share with that person. Call them, text them, or write them, and tell them your simple thanks. And I guarantee you that if we put this into daily practice, in less than a couple of weeks, the blessings of thanksgiving will become visible to us in our lives. And if we're not immediately aware of it, I guarantee you others will be. As this becomes an integral part of our lifestyle, continue to open yourself to the blessings that we receive daily from God. Share also with God a simple thanks and watch your blessings blossom. In closing these two passages, we are again reminded that our Bible is a word of encouragement, a voice of hope, a message of joy, and a journey sometimes encumbered with struggles, which results in praise for all of us who choose to participate. 
Let us pray. Our Lord, if we took the time, we would recognize, indeed, we have a lot to be thankful for. Most specifically, we have persons to be thankful for. Above all is you, your Son, your Spirit, that has given and has enabled and has equipped and continues to dwell and to be and to be ahead of. And then there are other individuals in our life who have done and who have meant so much, but perhaps we have been silent in our response. Remind us in this day to make that contact. And if they have passed from this place, let us make that contact in our prayer life. Lord, help us to truly begin to know the joys and the satisfaction that comes from being a thankful people. For we ask these things in the name of Christ our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen.